Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Gamble. I'm the president of the, the Washington College of Law, Art and Cultural Heritage Law Society. I'd like to take this time to thank those who are in person, as well as those who have joined us remotely for your attendance today. I would also like to thank Taniat and Matt Bowers for their assistance in planning this event, as well as the program on information justice and intellectual property and the program on law and government. This event marks the second installment of our three-part series on cultural heritage law, titled Historic Preservation and Cultural Heritage, where today we will focus on the ever-important field of historic preservation law and its unique intersection with cultural heritage law. You're a very special guest. Today, we are honored to be joined by a true trailblazer in the realm of historical preservation, chair of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, Sarah Bronin. In January 2023, she became chair of the council, which is a federally historic preservation agency intended to advise the president, Congress, state, and local members on historic preservation and policy. Chair Bronin's journey yeah. from the roots um, to the generation Texan, yeah. both a licensed oh, architect and an attorney, I think that his first her background has positioned her as a leader so in the field of historic Texas. preservation, bridging the world of urban planning, architecture, and law, and tackling the ever-changing definition of care to no, author I'm numerous wondering. books and treatises on a myriad of topics, including housing, urban planning, and historic preservation. Their Bronin holds appointments in various departments yeah. and agencies so, across the U.S. Okay. Today, we right. have the right. opportunity to gain insights from Chair yeah, Bronin on the legal workings of the ACHP and historic preservation and cultural heritage law. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Chair Sarah Bronin. Just about switching the to yeah. Okay, now nice introduction. Um, so I'm really glad to be here today. Um, I am normally a law professor, so uh, really very excited to be back at the law school. And thank you to Professor Farley for including me. Um, I am going to just give you guys a brief introduction to uh, the agency. And I really do view this as a conversation. So if you see something I'll probably present for about 15 minutes. If you see something in the slides that you're like, wait, what does that mean? You know, happy to, to stop there. And then, you know, happy to just answer questions, especially about careers and cultural heritage uh, law, because uh, as you know, it's fairly niche, as I just said, uh, for many. Um, so just to start out with what the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation is, uh, it is, as Andrew said, the Federal Historic Preservation Agency. It has 24 members and two functions. And so our members include um, nine federal agencies and the architect of the Capitol. Uh, these nine federal agencies, two of them are, are permanent. One is Interior, one is the US Department of Agriculture. Um, and the other, both, both of whom have significant land management functions across the federal government. The other seven are appointed by the president from time to time. So just as one example, the president uh, at my request, um, encouraging, uh, replace the Department of Education on the ACHP with the Council on Environmental Quality. And we can talk about why, but if you've taken an administrative law or environmental law, you know that CEQ plays a huge role in reviewing federal agency actions under NEPA. Um, so there's the nine federal agencies and architects of the Capitol. There's eight presidential appointees in, individually. I'm one of those, but I'm the only full-time uh, person on the council. Everybody else is, uh, is a this other seven presidential appointees are essentially volunteers. Um, the federal agency appointees are uh, attend our meetings in their office, um, as part of their office. Uh, we have a governor, mayor, and tribal member, all of them also have day jobs and are considered volunteers. Uh, the current governor is the governor of Delaware. The current mayor is Randall Woodson, the mayor of Rome, um, a person who has been instrumental in toppling statues uh, within the city uh, in. Uh, violation of state laws that prevent him from doing so. So more interesting historical dimension. And then finally, we have three organizational members. So the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which have you heard of this organization? It's basically the largest preservation membership organization. It was chartered by Congress in 1948. Um, and then we have two associations of state and tribal historical preservation officers both SHIPOs and TIPOs, as we say, mm -hmm. are part of the federal preservation program. So by law, by Congress uh, you know, directive, uh, we have uh, both of those entities as participants in the federal preservation system. 
Um, so the ACHP has two main functions. The first one is overseeing and administering this process that we nickname, um, I think I have a better slide on this, yeah, Section 106. Um, so that process is set out in the National Historic Preservation Act, um, which you probably have, didn't cover in property or environmental law, um, but it's actually hugely consequential. Uh, the National Historic Preservation Act in Section 106 affects 120,000 agency actions annually. Um, the second function that we have, um, as Andrew mentioned, is advising the president, Congress, and state and local governments on historic preservation policy. So we have, you could say, a regulatory function, an advisory function, and sometimes those two mesh, and sometimes they don't. So I'm going to talk, um, maybe I'll just talk about my role as chair and then turn to 106. So as the, the full-time chair, I should say I'm only the second full-time chair that the agency has had. Um, the first one, uh, they changed the law a few years ago to require that the agency have a full-time Senate confirmed chair, as opposed to prior chairs, uh, which dating back to 1966, when the advisory council was formed, were volunteers. And so you think of an agency run by a volunteer and you know what that might uh, imply, which I think in the past has largely meant that the advisory council has played a pretty minor role in DC in, in sort of decision-making and policy-making. It hasn't really fulfilled its congressional mandate to serve as really a lead advisor to, um, to all of these entities. Um, so as chair, I now have you know, the full-time responsibility to lead the agency. Um, I do try to represent the views of the council. Sometimes we take votes. I'm gonna talk about a few things that we've taken votes on. Most times we don't. So I kind of have to get the gist of what the council members um, would like for me to say before speaking. Um, thinking about our statutory obligations, I think before I got to this position, there were many years when even our, our staff and past chairs didn't really read the full list of things that the Advisory Council was supposed to do under the National Historic Preservation Act. One of those things I'll talk about towards the end of the presentation is advising state and local governments on draft legislation. The ACHP has never really done that before this year when we now have a process to do that um, because I'm a law professor. So I read all the bullet points and I said, oh, do we do this? No, we don't do this. So let's do it. Um, it says we're supposed to do it. And we lo I love giving advice. If anybody wants advice, I'll give you advice. <laughs> um, uh, then finally, really try to develop a direction for the council. So I have tried to push the council in new directions. Um, and that includes not only the fellow members, but the staff that supports uh, the council members. So just briefly, I wanted to talk about the main regulatory process that we do, and then maybe that will generate some questions um, in conversation. So how many people have heard of NEPA, the national, okay, so what, do you remember what its main function is? Um, I think you should explain. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say anything stupid in front of everybody. <laughs> well, I'll give you a clue. It's a stop, look, and listen statute. Uh, so NEPA, if you've looked at it, if, again, if you take an admin or environmental law, uh, you learn that NEPA merely sets out a process by which agencies, federal agencies, have to evaluate the impacts of their actions on the environment. National Historic Preservation Act in Section 106 is similarly a stop, look, and listen statute. This is the language of the statute. The head of any federal agency so um, we actually have had case law trying to define what a federal agency is. So do you think the Federal Reserve Board is a federal agency? Is it maybe? Some courts have said yes. Um, we know that Department of the Interior, we know, we know what, but, but there are these other sort of entities that may or may not be considered federal agencies of our, and under this phrase. But anyway, the head of any federal agency shall, prior to the approval of an undertaking, take into account the effect of the undertaking on any historic property and afford the ACHP, that's us, a reasonable opportunity to comment regarding the undertaking. So what it looks like here is the ACHP uh, can maybe comment. It sounds such, like such a weak power. Um, and in some ways it is, but in other ways, um, we harness that comment power to push agencies to, to do what the statute requires them to do, which is to take into account the impact of their actions. Okay, so what are undertakings? This is the most disputed word in that, just like underneath a major federal action is the most disputed phrase. So undertakings are actions that are directly done by an agency. So um, I don't know, I don't have 
examples in the next slide, but um, so things like building a federal courthouse, building a federal highway, so things that federal government does. But undertakings are also defined as actions that are funded, licensed, permitted, or otherwise approved by an agency. So when HUD gives money to public housing authorities, um, when there are subsidies involved in state and local transportation projects that come from the federal government, when the federal government is permitting wind energy, when the Bureau of Land Management is licensing land for mining, each and every one of those actions is subject to 106 review. That's why there are 120,000 separate actions that federal agencies undertake that we estimate that they're reviewing the impacts of their, their actions on historic properties. A license for a mine, for example, might have impacts on tribal resources. The expansion of a highway might have impacts on black burial grounds. The, the construction of, the, of a courthouse might raise security concerns that lead to demolition of, uh, of historic buildings nearby. All three of those examples I just gave are live, active, controversial examples um, that agencies are currently uh, reviewing uh, under our process. So just a note about the 106 process, it starts with um, a trigger. So there is an undertaking. That's the first point. If there is an undertaking, then um, the agency has to identify, well, what historic properties are basically in the vicinity or might be affected by this undertaking. Then if there are effects, they have to assess whether they're adverse effects. If there are adverse effects, there has to be, some people use the phrase mitigation, the statute requires merely consideration of the effects. So in theory, an agency could consider the effects and say, well, that's really too bad that that graveyard has to be removed or that historic building has to be turned down and simply, you know, move on. But we've encouraged and our, our regulations require what we call resolution. Um, I do think there's, we can talk about the difference between mitigation and resolution and maybe it's a matter of semantics because for the most part, the resolution does have some mitigation impact. So for example, a federal agency will that pay compensation, will do a survey, will take photographs and do documentation. Um, there are a lot of ways to resolve adverse effects, um, but there's not a format. During the 106 process, there's a lot of entities involved. One is the lead federal agency. Um, one is uh, the state, the SHPO, TIPO, the State and Tribal Historic Preservation Office. A big one that I always hold is tribes. So during the Section 106 process, um, federally recognized tribes are mandatory consulting parties, as are NHOs, Native Hawaiian organizations. So next week, I'm going to spend time in, in Hawaii uh, meeting with Native Hawaiian organizations and representatives uh, because that is a Biden administration initiative to try to encourage greater uh, consultation um, with Native Hawaiians. And our process represents probably the one of the best processes where we can boost their voice um, in accordance with our statutory mandate. Um, and in a way that I think we probably haven't done before. So next week is an opportunity for me to learn and to understand how we can, um, we already know, we do, I think, a great job with tribal consultation um, and federal agencies, uh, you know, have generally uh, worked a lot to improve their tribal consultation. Um, but the Native Hawaiian angle is not one that I think we've fully delved into. Um, local governments also play a role. So if a mayor wants to get involved in something in her town, uh, she can roll in and say, I'm going to be a consulting party. And that um, the, the agency has to accept that if it's a certified local government. Um, and then applicants. Uh, so for example, a wind energy uh, uh, provider, somebody who wants to build on federal land, the mining company, again, just using the examples that I've used. These are private parties who are part of the consulting process. Um, and then there are others who can raise their hand and say, I want to talk about this. And so all of these people get around the table, usually not at the same time, um, but they, they each contribute to, um, to especially uh, when there's an adverse effect or when there's a resolution. So <clears throat> that's the regulatory process. So put that aside for a minute. And I want to get to the advising that we've done, particularly over the last year, and just talk really briefly about four policy statements we've covered, because I think the, the fact that we have this 24 member body, including um, nine of these 10 federal agencies um, makes these policy statements potentially very impactful 
um, and recognizes the federal government has a role to play in cultural heritage um, in many different dimensions and historic preservation. So these two terms are different in, uh, in many circles. So historic preservation is really meant to refer to this, um, th these, uh, I would say, building-focused um, rules that we've set out. Cultural heritage, we really think about more like objects and art and things like that, which are not the things typically historic preservation law courses or, or uh, uh, practitioners necessarily cover. But I encourage you to think about both of these uh, big areas as being something that um, that we should be considering together and maybe in the absence of anybody else, other than the State Department and from an international perspective, but anybody else really coordinating on cultural heritage, um, that the ACHP should be the one um, to help to promote that. Um, so the first, well, going back, the first statement uh, is on climate change and historic preservation, housing and historic, preser and historic preservation, burial sites, human remains, and funerary objects and indigenous knowledge. The first two, I would say, are, are somewhat broadly applicable and address two of the main challenges that the Biden administration has uh, hoped to address. Um, and then the second two are, um, I would say, you know, certainly broadly applicable, but, um, but have special interest to the tribal community, Native Hawaiian community, and other indigenous peoples. And I can explain um, those in a, in a minute. So this first policy statement on climate change and historic preservation. So what are the intersections between climate change and, and historic properties? Like what, what are the issues do you think those two big picture topics might raise? Yeah. Just the historic property aspect of this book. Providing sea levels is a very different as far as the water. Okay, so you have specific climate related risks to historic resources. So you raise sea level rise. Can anybody think of any other climate risks? Yeah. Yes, increasing temperatures in areas that are kind of fire prone um, can cause more fires and destruction of their preserved sites. So let's look at what just happened in Lahaina in Maui where wildfires obliterated um, the historic cultural, uh, at least the, the town center and of course um, resulted in the loss of many lives. Um, so that wildfires is another one. Yes? We, somebody, oh, yeah. Um, I was going to say like potentially down the road you could see having to move off of um, areas where they're able to preserve their own land and typically that would affect disadvantage. So and if you think about our rules right now at the federal level, we say you can't relocate. So the historic preservation standards, which I'll talk about in a minute because it's one of my favorite topics, say you can't relocate historic properties because that diminishes their integrity of setting and location. We say for sea level rise, you can't raise buildings because that detracts from how they look to the streets, an aesthetic argument. You can't put landscape related fire breaks in uh, sort of large scale landscape interventions to prevent wildfires in cultural landscapes because that violates what we think of as cultural landscape. You can put a ditch there, you can you know, remove a whole bunch of trees, but our federal preservation standards prevent this adaptation response that we, that we need. And that's one of the things that I've been um, beating a drum at um, not necessarily to everybody's great pleasure. Um, so we talked about adaptation. Any other intersections between climate change and historic preservation as um, fields? Yeah. I guess the law is affecting climate change can be addressed towards historic preservation. So sort of like NEPA. Okay, so so a section 106. So how do how do federal agencies dispose of their responsibilities under 106, taking both of these into account? Um, what about things like installing renewable energy on historic buildings? So this too is something that federal historic preservation standards are rules and regs and guidance at the federal level, not by the ACHP. Um, say shouldn't be done if the solar panel is visible. But again, we're in a climate crisis. Um, it shouldn't be. You shouldn't be putting new windows in because they're not historic. Um, I just heard from somebody who's being forced to put single pane, uh, non-operable windows in an old schoolhouse um, because that's uh, they wanted to put triple pane energy efficient windows and they can't do it because of historic preservation uh, standards. Um, so again, thinking about all the ways that historic properties and climate um, interact can maybe help inform why we we set out these policy principles and and. These policy statements are statements that are voted on by the members. They have um, they set out 
what our policy as an agency will be. Um, and they are about 10 to 15 pages long. They're not huge, but they have explanations for each of these topics. There's, there's 15 policy principles that, that we put out. Um, so planning for climate change, incorporating indigenous knowledge, preparing for disaster, um, addressing the response after a disaster, because there is, aren't really clear rules about how um, FEMA, state and local governments deal with historic um, debris, uh, for example. Expedited clean energy and transportation projects. So this is one, we adopted this in July, and I have been knocking on DOT's door to say, I, we said, we voted, DOT's a member, we said we wanted to fast track clean energy, pro clean transportation projects. So during the 106 process, so let's do it. And I'm still waiting for them to kind of get organized. But that is a huge priority, um, both for the Biden administration. It should be a priority for all of us. We should um, fast track biking, walking um, infrastructure and all the investments that are being made so that we don't have to worry about, um, uh, you know, about red tape inadvertently getting in, in the way of these um, solutions that actually benefit historic districts um, and historic places, because historic places were not built for cars. They were built in an era where people um, you know, had many other types of transportation. I'm not saying let's bring back horses, but um, I mean, that would be necessarily that bad. Uh, number 10 is uh, the one that I am laser focused on as well, which is we need more flexible guidance at the federal level so that we can address the adaptation and mitigation concerns. Um, so the need for data too is one that I've been uh, harping on. We have really good data now on climate risk, but we have zero data uh, that tells us where historic resources are. If you've ever tried to look at a map for historic resources, to find historic resources, and they tried to do this, DC, what you what'd you find? What were you looking for? It was in uh, Diné country, and it was, it's a disaster. There's no actual data on well, there's some, but yeah. So that's an interesting, so you're talking about tribal tribal land. So a really interesting thing. So we did a, I had three law students working, lot, three, actually one law student, an undergraduate and a graduate student. It was just, it was just the one law student working last summer on looking at tribal historic preservation ordinances and their registers. And um, interestingly, tribal registers are basically never online. And that is because many of those resources are considered confidential or considered sensitive. And so I'm not even talking, when I go around talking about data about tribal resources or archeological resources, because there are reasons that we might want to keep those confidential. But you raise the point that, you know, maybe somebody who could use that information might not be able to get it. What were you looking for? Um, I have an interest in the Irish archeologist uh, tradition of historical the Serving House in the uh, early 1800s. Okay, so you found what you were looking for. Yes, uh, the English Empire excellent record keeping we do none of that um so but but i think in order to understand how we're supposed to respond to climate we need to know where historic properties are so here in dc dc has a pretty good map online of all of its historic districts locally designated districts the national register which is different from the local register is not fully mapped even in dc boundaries the park service has a disclaimer on their website that says our national register map hasn't been updated since 2012. Um, so you look at uh, other states um, and their state registers as well. Um, of course, DC doesn't have a state register, but um, you look at other states and those are not mapped and available online um, entirely. And certainly they're not all together. So it, it's, I agree with the concept it's a mess. Um, we need a central government response. We need more federal preservation standards. Can I ask a quick question on sure. that? Do you have authority to um, sort of mobilize a, a citizen a sort of citizen science group to do kind of an open street map layer one, like you wouldn't necessarily trust what they gave you without verifying, but at least you could have, you know, layer one information that would you would limit the amount of resources necessary to create a comprehensive map. Yeah, that's it. So I, so um, on my non-historic preservation side, I run a project called the National Zoning Atlas. And what we are doing with that project is we are taking the 36,000 jurisdictions all over the country that might have zoning, we're determining if they have zoning, and then we're extracting 120 different regulatory characteristics from each jurisdiction and putting them into a unified map. So that's at zoningatlas.org if anybody's into zoning. Um, but you can, we've done DC, you can look at the jurisdiction and you can figure out, okay, what does each, what does each district within the jurisdiction allow, particularly with regard to housing? 
And we started the project with a sort of volunteer mentality. Oh, just start a team and you can provide us information. Uh, we quickly found that in order to provide accurate information, you need full-time analysts, which we now, I now have 22 people working on that project for me. Um, and we do have affiliate teams, but those are sort of um, uh, winding down because we have found that um, the crowdsourcing concept, which was great to get it started and to get the momentum going, um, does not necessarily result in accurate uh, data. So I think the historic would be the same way where somebody might crowdsource and say, well, this is historic, this is on this register, and then you look and it's not necessarily on there, or the coordinates are not necessarily correct. So I do think a professional sort of the overall effort for this would be um, it would be in order, and um, I'm a big advocate for that uh, across our, our potential funding sources. Um, housing and historic preservation. So the second big policy statement. So as you just heard, um, one of my very strong policy interests is in housing policy. And we had a po policy statement on the books for 2007, but it was really limited in what it said. It said um, that um, it focused on only affordable housing, and it only focused on the Section 106 process. So it didn't have all, anything that state and local governments could do that uh, private parties can and should do. And housing has become a touch point in historic preservation. So if you've been reading the New York Times recently, you've got, you see this member of the editorial board at preservation has become the enemy of evolution. So there's a lot of historic preservation. Uh, rhetoric of people who are not preservationists who don't understand that actually preservation and housing production go hand in hand. And that is not necessarily the case just for affordable housing. Historic preservation has produced a large number of market rate units, which are also important to relieve the housing supply um, uh, crisis. So here too, we've put out uh, collaboratively with our agency members, um, I think a pretty bold statement that I am now working through um, and I've taken and, and run with HUD, another one of our members to try to implement some of this stuff, particularly for seven flexible federal guidance. Um, but also um, working with state and local governments on zoning reforms like accessory dwelling units and minimum lot sizes and parking requirements and mixed uses um, that are necessary for historic buildings to reach their potential when it comes to housing. Um, building codes, uh, there's a huge investment in the Biden administration on building codes. We haven't quite gotten those folks to, to pay attention to the historic buildings dimension. But if we did, we would be able to unlock more conversions in particular, because you have large historic buildings with, uh, you have commercial office buildings with large floor plates that need to be changed um, uh, and modified and building codes need to support that in order for the conversions to actually happen. Um, we are gonna be doing, our agency can issue uh, 106 related guidance. We are doing that right now. Um, there's historic tax credits, which are an important source of, uh, of um, funding that we say, as we always do, uh, let's expand those. Um, so key principles from this statement that I'm really take, trying to take and run with is legalizing housing through zoning. Um, the research dimension, um, just like there's not a good map, there's really bad research on historic preservation in the intersection of housing. Um, we also, again, that federal preservation standards is really important to me. So last two policy statements, um, one on burial sites, human remains, and funerary objects. So this was a very important um, statement that we revised from an inadequate prior statement um, that was is really aimed at federal, state, and local governments who have in the past done projects that have disrupted and disrespected burial sites. Um, so what we say in this policy statement is disturbance should be a last resort. Um, we should defer to descendant communities. Um, we should respect indigenous knowledge. Um, we recognize things like the Federal Indian Boarding School Initiative, which resulted in many Indian children dying and being buried on federal land, um, often uh, in, uh, with great indignity. Um, we recognize that the impact of climate change on burial sites uh, is significant, particularly erosion related to development, um, neighboring development, um, as well as increased precipitation. Um, and recognizing that and the particular impacts on black uh, tribal and other underrepresented communities uh, burial sites, uh, we think calls for more planning and coordination at the federal, state, and local levels. Um, again, so, you know, key principles here are the indigenous knowledge, uh, descendant communities, recognizing explicitly past wrongs, especially the ones done by the federal government and 
for climate change. So that policy statement was adopted a year ago. A year after that, last month, we just adopted this indigenous knowledge policy statement, which you already saw was mentioned in the climate statement, mentioned in the burial site statement, um, and is really important because when you look back at the section 106 process that all federal agencies have to undertake, they're getting input from archeologists they hire, they're paying for that. They're getting input from the mayor, they're getting input. But, but what has not been formally recognized in the past is that tribes don't have to prove through writing or through their PhD, PhDs that they have, that they know something that is relevant to the 106 process. So indigenous knowledge, we say, for the first time across all of these agencies, it's that indigenous knowledge is valid and self-supporting. That in and of itself is a really big change. Um, so we have, again, as ACHP, we've always tried to advance the tribal perspective and fulfill our government to government obligations. But this says that a tribal leader, a representative of a tribe that comes into a consulting process, again, doesn't have to prove why they know something, how they know something. They don't have to go back and get recordings of their great grandmother to prove there was an oral history. They simply have to state it and declare an indigenous knowledge. Some people might say, well, that's really dangerous because you could just say my indigenous knowledge is X, Y, or Z and, and you know, really screw something up. And you know, the truth is, is that you know, we recognize both in the burial site statement and this one that the scales have been tilted so far in the other direction um, that that's certainly a risk we feel is well worth taking. Um, yeah, out of deference to uh, indigenous knowledge at all steps of the uh, of the section of the process. Um, I'll mention number nine compensation um, because currently in the 106 process, tribes are not required to be compensated when they provide knowledge to federal agencies that help federal agencies support their, um, uh, their and here just the, the, the principles that I am really pulling out. So that that so when the federal agencies ask tribes to, for example, do a survey or produce information, um, not as part of their consultation, but as part of sort of the information providing, tribes are not required to be compensated. So in my the one chance I've had so far to unilaterally as chair amend an agreement on broadband, um, I did amend the agreement to allow for a much wider range of broadband activities to be fast tracked through our process, but put a provision in there that said that tribes had to be compensated um, for their expertise. And so that happened actually before we did the indigenous knowledge policy statement, um, but that is a provision, you know, I helped to write it, it's in that document, and I hope to take that to every single 106 um, document that we, that we do. So just briefly tying this together, um, taking all of these uh, actions, incorporating them into 106, um, pushing for more flexible federal preservation standards, informing state and local decision-making and raising awareness, um, on the 106 side, again, we're issuing new guidance on housing and climate. We're expediting determinations about what can constitute an adverse effect. Um, I issued a 600 page report on the secretary of standards, and I urge you to read it if you have any interest in, in historic preservation, because these standards dictate all of historic preservation practice. And, and the more I dug into this report, the more I said, this is like a really big problem. I issued public, I call for public comments. We got public comments, they're included in the appendix. And I think if you read through them, first of all, you should get great law review article fodder, but also um, I hope that it convinces you that we have to change that. Um, and it's the Department of the Interior that manages that. Um, state and local advising. So state laws um, that were climate response, we tackled those in Florida. Of course, that law passed. Um, it's, going to result in the in the destruction of historic buildings on the Florida coast. Um, it's bad. Um, there I was in Charleston talking to the Charleston Preservation Society about how their zoning rules um, actually are really on the front lines of adapting to climate change. It's a city that floods 50 times a year. Um, and then just raising awareness, I guess that was my last bullet point. So part of it is uh, talking to you all today, um, but I really tried to have in all of these media forums um, a presence um, and really trying to raise the level and involvement of the public in our work because um, the public deserves to, to be included. So that's it. And I'm happy to just kind of chat and take questions. Yeah.